so it 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 gives uh, uh, sure okay so that, that's a good question so all right so you know we th th it seems like there was this error where Pankaj isn't able to get import requests to work so requests it seems like uses uh, there is an outside library so for instance I don't I'm not able to reproduce it on my machine but if you're getting okay no package requests so you can there's basically you want to use pip pip is a uh, is a way to download other libraries right so I would do pip3 install the requests library right the other thing you could do is copy and paste the error obviously into Google uh, so no module requests something like that Python. You know, but, but uh, if if this thing works in Jupyter, uh, why will not this work in in VS Code? So, yeah. So okay. that means I have the requests. Uh, I mean, if Jupyter should also not work unless. Uh, well, they can be using two different versions of two different installations of Python on your computer. So there's two different things. One is if it's in Colab, right? Colab is doing it on one of Google's computers, not ours. So that's that's one thing. And Got it. that already has it installed. Two, even if you're using Jupyter locally, like using Anaconda, Anaconda has a different version of Python and has, has a second version of Python installed for you and would need to be installed through Anaconda. Uh, you know, and, and so anyway, that's the reason why it could not be there for you. So if you're doing it just through pip3 install request, you know, if, if you're doing it through this environment, through the terminal, right, this is, by typing pip3, first of all, that means I'm installing this with Python 3, and you can see this is, this is actually installing, in my case, with, it seems like, miniconda, like that is the version of Python it's using, I guess I set my environment up to do that, and then it's installing it here, okay, so you can even, uh, you know, this is just a place on your computer. Like we could CD into this and then open it. And here you can see, you know, the various libraries that are installed. You see, I have a bunch, right? Including the uh, the request library is installed here. Okay. And and VS Code make use of Anaconda, right? I mean, it. it well, that, it looks... that's that's complicated too because if you just run, if you. Uh, Say so you run by doing Python three. Uh, let's take a let's go out. So I'm gonna just drop this file. I think. Can I do this? Yeah. Okay. So I just drop the file in my terminal so that I quickly get the path to it, and then I. Uh, but I have to just delete the index.py file. All right. So now I'm here. So if you type Python three, now it's using that same. Python environment in your shell, okay? Uh, so Python 3, you know, index.py. It will, if I do something like import requests, it's going to be using the environment that's loaded in the terminal in uh, here. However, if you're using this terminal, which I tend not to use, but I think for some computers like Windows machines, sorry about that. Uh, it may be easier to use. Some students have preferred to use it. If you do this new terminal thing, you know, this can be using different versions, like a separate version of Python. Uh, what you have to do is look at what version, you can see here it tells me what version of Python it's using. And you can see that here it's using this opbrew Python 3.11 thing, which is different, I think, than what we just saw was being used. So it, it depends. If I run it from here, it's a different Python than if I run it from here. Okay. Right. You can select it to make it the same. All right. So yeah, like these are different environmental issues that can crop up. Oh, good point. Yeah. So you can see which version of Python you're using in either case by typing like which is it which Python 3. And you can see, okay, this is the version that's being used from the shell. 
users Jeff Miniconda bin three bin Python three. If I do which Python through three here, this is different. These are not the same. Users Jeffrey Katz Miniconda Python three versus Homebrew Python Python three. I can switch them. I think. Let's do that. Jeffrey Katz Miniconda Python three. Uh, Miniconda, maybe this is the same now. Now if I do which Python 3? No, it doesn't appear to be. I maybe you have to might have to start a new tab or something. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But why will you do so many uh, Python? I mean, because they're installed. It's not like we, you know, I chose to. Like it's, uh, it, when we download a VS code, it's to get this thing working out of the box, it's using its own like Python three, I believe. Like you know, making sure. And then Anaconda. If you download Anaconda, it comes with its own version of Python. Um, so it's just like these different. And then your Mac, when you buy the Mac, it already has Python installed on it, right? So this is why you know you can you want to pay attention to this. So this now, yeah, now maybe it's. Lines up. I, I don't know. Maybe I have to do a new tab. I just did this. Uh, maybe I have to do conda deactivate. And now which Python? User bin. So you can see once I did this, I, 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 this is kind of like a bit of a, we haven't talked about conda because we haven't had to. So if you're able to get it working, I don't want to really go down this route right now, uh, but just know that you can see like that all of a sudden VS Code was using its own, was using this environment. And now that I've said don't use, it, it's using, I guess, Anaconda underneath. And now that I'm saying don't use that virtual environment, now it's defaulting back to user bin Python. So, you know, it's just a matter of, I guess, knowing that the Python you're using in the terminal can be different than the Python you're using in the VS Code terminal, right? And then of course, when you go to Colab, well, that's not even on your computer, right? Google is, this is on Google's computer. You know, you're just accessing it through a website. And, you know, that's why it takes a second for us to run the code, right? We're running it on Google's computer. And you can see, one thing to point out is, you can see the various Python library, like, you know, we can do this, which Python, and then you can also do like pip three list. And you can see these are all the libraries I have installed, right, by pip three list. Okay, and these are the packages installed under Python three. That's different than pip list, right, which is, in other words, if I type Python three, that's using everything we just saw with, uh, you know, under pip3 list. But if I just type Python, which is using version like Python 2, right? I guess it's not. I guess in this case they hacked it, so it's the same version. It's oh, I'm always using Python 3. But maybe on a different computer, it would be going to using Python 2. That then would have its own set of libraries installed. So just you just pay attention to these details, right? I generally only am using Python 3. Like I'm only typing Python 3 in here. And when I am installing something, I'm doing pip3 install the requests library. All right. And you can see where it's installing it under Miniconda, Python 3.9, site packages, etc. But Jeff, uh... In in typical project scenario, there will be different uh, developers working, so they will be doing their own thing. So how will once they migrate to the, the to the system, how will these things will synchronize? I mean, you'll have well one. There's a couple of things. One is Docker. You know, so we'll have Docker will make the environment consistent. Two is, uh, you know, in terms of the packages. With the packages, you'll create a requirements.txt file. And in that requirements.txt file, it will list oftentimes all the packages you need to install. And then all you do, so if we open this up, 
is you'll list, you know, they'll list, say, requests and pandas, right? And then what you'll do is you'll do pip3 install dash r requirements.txt. So install everything that's listed in this requirements.txt file. All right, and you can see that's what it's doing here. And it's saying, hey, we already have it. I don't need to install it, but that's what you would do. And you can, you know, this one, I don't know if it has a requirements.txt. I'm sure it has some sort of equivalent. Uh, well, we can see if it has it. There it is, requirements.txt file. So like in the Airflow, here's all the, here, here's it, the libraries. And again, I would clone this down and then run, you know, pip3 requirements.txt. Okay. All right. So let's go through testing. So, all right. So basically, you know, the point I want to give across with testing, you know, one is, right, like, in your projects, like, in life, you should always be writing tests. Uh, like, in the code base I worked in, three times the amount of, we, we had th three, three, many, three times as much, for every line of code, there were three lines of tests. Let me put it that way. Okay, so uh, why does something like that happen? It's like you want to check like each scenario. If there's a bug, like that means that something wasn't well tested. So we have to write a test to like, you know, that will say when this occurs, make sure it doesn't break. So, and one other thing to note is like when you guys are coding, like when you're coding with uh, say like Colab, like you're naturally kind of writing tests or we essentially wrote the tests for you because we gave you scenarios. We said, hey, if, if you get this input, don't you, you know, we should expect a certain output from the function. And that's really all a test is. It's just saying, hey, when you get this, we should, we would expect this as a return value, this as the output, all right? That's really it. So it's like when we, when this occurs or when we pass through, you know, this data, we expect certain output. So an example might be, uh, here I have like a track name, you know, and I would say, if I pass this function, if I pass this track through the clean track function, I expect, what do I expect? I expect this that it's gonna, we're gonna get this as the output. So then all we do is you can just put in equals equals here, right? If I pass this string through my function and this function cleans the track, I would expect that we don't have this hyphen remix anymore. And maybe we'll just print for now what we get back. Um, so now I can run Python 3 index.py and think about what's going to occur here. We're going to give it some sort of data. We're going to execute the function. And then we're going to check that the output equals this specified output. And we see that we got true. That's, that's really a test. You know, like all tests work the same. What they have is you have the sample data. We can call this like the setup. We can you execute the function so we can call this like the cleaned track this is executing the function right and then we have like an assertion or you check the result you know um so we're going to check that the clean track equals this string so basically to write a test you give it an example you give it a scenario and you say when we pass in something like this, I would expect this to be the output, All right? And that's really it, you know, what you can do then is you can put an assert statement here, and this just like kind of adds like a little bit of, you could see in a, like Jupyter Lab. Does it do anything? Yeah. Shoot, it doesn't seem like it actually. I, th I guess because it worked. If it failed, 
let's say that let's say uh, we delete this. So now it gives me a list. Now it says, okay, we have an assertion error, right? And it says, hey, it's basically telling me this did not equal that. And maybe what I what I could say is you can specify as the second argument here what you expect this error message to be. So I can say did not return a string or something like that. Okay, so now you can see the assertion error is that this clean track did not return a string. I don't love like, you know, how what would be a better test to make sure it returns a string? Well, it would be clean track that this result right here, probably that the type, you know, equals equals str. Right? That would be me checking, I guess, that it right? So when it doesn't equal when this type is not a string, I'm telling it, hey, this this is what I expect, you know? So, cool. So this is, uh, right, so this is like a, a tool. And then this is also an example of how you can write more than one test, essentially, as your, what you're checking. So you'll say, like, removes the hyphen. Right, or removes the word remix. So assert, how do we test that? Assert clean track. And then maybe we'll put, uh, what would you like, assume, assert that remix not in clean track or something like that. Or maybe we'd have to use an include function. This might work. So the error is still includes remix okay so let and let's just remove this so now we're just we're not doing anything with the track name we're just simply returning it and my guess is this clean track because when we pass this through the function it's still going to just have the original string of remix see that and you can check you know we can let's uh Let's let's start making this real. Like what you can do is then you would check. You would like take a look at the clean track, see what's going on, and you want to fix the code, right? We want to fix this code so that this thing works. So, like how how did we do that? Our way of doing that was to split this based on the hyphen. That turns this into a list, and then just select the first element, right? And now both of our tests should pass. Because this thing, because we're selecting the first element, now all of a sudden we're returning a string. And here, now we are removing the word remix. OK? Right? And then maybe you'd say, like, wait a second, but what if we have the word remix in here? Well, then you'd write another test. <laughs> how, do we, how do we do that? All right, well, let's give an example. Sergeant Pepper's remix, Lonely Heart Club's band, right? And we'll call this a uh, remix track track name with remix. And we want to say assert. Let's call this function that clean track. And here we'll pass through this new data, this new example. And what do we want to do? We want to make sure that remix that uh, the string just equals this. We'll just say that the string just equals this data. And that way we want to make sure that remix is still included. And if it doesn't, uh, so we'll say assert clean track equals equals this example. And then we'll say like the problem is it removed both remixes, right? So you know, if we did a different implementation where say we looked for all the examples of remix and removed it, this would break. But it feels like in this example, this one should be good, right? Because we're splitting on the hyphen and just removing this. And you can see we did not get an error message here. All right. So this is why it's like every time you kind of have a question about the code of like, oh, would I handle this scenario?
We give it that scenario, right? It did not, it took us like, what, less than a minute to, to write this code, okay? And now what's nice about it is, and what we'll see is, you know, once we have this written down, right? We don't have to keep rechecking it. We just, we'll just run our code. And because we have this somewhere, it will automatically check it. So if I change the implementation, let's say I didn't realize, think of this later on. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe we have a more efficient way. Why don't we just like use the, you know, change this implementation so that it removes all occurrences of remix. Well, then we'd run, rerun all our tests and we'd see that this breaks. Okay. And that's like the idea is that this kind of, with the tests, you're testing various scenarios, just like if you're testing a car or something, and it's just a checklist to make sure our implementation passes that checklist. Yeah, so assert, um, I mean, for our purposes, assert really just checks, does this equal that, you know? Does the thing on the left equal the thing on the right? And you can see it's just giving us when it does not, when it works, nothing happens, right? You see no output. When it fails, it raises an assertion error. Okay, so it throws an error. The other functionality of assert is that you can put a second argument here. So the first argument, you think of assert as like a function you're calling. The first argument is that this equals that, that basically this is true, that this returns true right? The second argument is when it returns false, do you want to specify more details about what the error is? So for instance here, uh, I think we're asserting that this is a string. If this thing is not a string, we can say, you know, must clean track, must return a string. Something like that. I don't like, I don't know why, it's the parentheses that got it started being weird about that. But now you see that we're like kind of specifying what we want to throw as the error, as more details. So, you know, one thing I want to know, like, is just, like I see on Twitter, you know, I see like, you know, I, I go on Twitter sometimes, and I see that people like, are like, oh, we shouldn't, it's testing's a waste of time and blah, blah, and it's like, well, when you have a question to the code about the code, don't like like this. Like, what if the word is remix in there? Isn't this what you do anyway? Like, don't you like write out the string and like make sure your function works and like then you know. And also, if you're doing these two lines, all we're doing is just heart is just putting this in our text editor and then adding an assertion. It takes like very little time when you get it the hang of it. Um, so, and the benefit is, instead of just checking this once when you're thinking of it, writing the code, by write, having it in a file, it's always running. And, and that's what's nice about it, okay? So that, like, years later, right, like, a code base lasts, like, years, uh, you will, you won't have to remember every little, you know, requirement for every function. And you can freely change the function and as long as it passes the tests, you're good. I worked with developers who would just be like, is this code being used? And just delete the code and then run all the tests. And if no tests broke, ship it. You know, like they would, that was it. Like they, you know, oh, this code doesn't look like it's being used. Run all the tests. No, nothing's breaking. We're good. And that's the benefit of like writing uh, good tests is if you really have a full test space, like if it passes the test, it is good. And you can freely change your code and not have to worry about, oh, if I make this one change, it introduces eight different bugs. As you can imagine, that's miserable, right? You can just experiment with your code base, which makes it way more pleasant to do. All right, so I do want to move into file. Like we, sh we should start using some files for this. So what we'll do, here's clean track. And this is the same idea, right? We have our example, right? This is our setup. We then execute the code and then we're gonna assert, right? So let's actually move this one. We'll, this is gonna be 
the string thing. So here we are giving ourselves an example. We pass it through clean track, and we assert that this is going to return a string. So what I would do, the way that you do this with PyTest, which is a testing library, very thin, is all you do is you write the word test. You start with the word test, and then the next set of words is whatever you want. But you generally write something that's descriptive. So you'll say clean track test. This can be as long as you want. That clean track returns a string, right? So, and then you just put parentheses and colon. And uh, I should put the word A. So we, so this is the whole point of this test is to test that clean track returns a string. This, as long as you have the word test, the rest of this doesn't matter. But it does matter for like a developer to to read this and see what what is the point of this test. All right, test that clean track returns a string. What will I do next? I'm going to run. I don't even know if I have PyTest installed, but I'll run PyTest followed by index.py, and you can see it, it passes. You see this nice little pretty thing? And this dot, that means one test pass. So if it did not do this, like let's break this, so that now it returns a list, and when we run PyTest again, now we get a failure. So it says clean track must return a string. Assert that a list, so this is what's getting on the left-hand left side, we're getting we're typing type of clean track, and it's actually giving us back a list where we want it to be a string. Okay? And what are we calling type on? It's actually showing us a little bit more. We're getting list because we're calling type on this data structure, which is a list. Okay? So what would we do if we're like confused by this? One, we might just put a breakpoint here and be like, wait a second, how is this not a string? All right, well, let's run the code, run PyTest. And that's going to run my test, which is going to, you know, declare this variable, call the function, and then, and now we're in our breakpoint. So we are, we are right here, and you can just check it, right? You can just say, okay, what is clean track? Oh, clean track's a list. Wait, are we sure? Okay, just reproduce the code, right? And then let's say you're still kind of confused. Why is it returning a list? Just put a breakpoint here. Just go into the function, right? And then we'll exit out of here and we'll run PyTest again. PyTest is going to call my test, right? Sergeant Peppers, which calls my function and then passes through this variable name and I'm right here, right? So what should I be able to do? If I type track name, What's track name going to be? Remember, I'm like pause in the execution. So it's taking this track name and it's passing it through here. And that's where I exist right now. So if I type track name, it is this that I pass through. Then what happens? Well, I can just rerun the code. That makes sense. Right? And I can do track name dot split. Just, I'm just literally copying and pasting the code. And now square bracket, oh wait, this is a list. I actually want to get this, square bracket zero. This is a beautiful way to debug, right? It's like, I, if I have the test already written, just run the test and then it will, you know, hit my, I can put a breakpoint in there and then I can just update the code. Oh, cool, this is what I need to do, square bracket zero. Great, remove the breakpoint, run the test, exit out of here, run it again. Now we're back into green, right? By green, I mean the test passes. And you can see that, you know, it spits out green. When it, when it fails, right, it spits out red. So if someone say you're in, you're in red, right, you're breaking. All right. Go ahead, questions. But really, how will this help in the sense uh... We are anyway, as a developer, we are anyway going to test it, right, before we release it. How? So, uh, no, no, no. so without the assert itself, we, we are going to test it, right? I mean, when we how, write how are you going to test it, though? You're going to, like, click through, try every function? 
you know, j- just like what we did earlier. So we are going to run the code, and it is going to spit out the error. Then you are going to troubleshoot that error, right. and once it runs successful, and then we just say, hey, it works. So yeah, but but that is, like if you have like five functions, okay, but you know you have thousands of functions. You change one over here; they all touch each other. And that this one change over, if I change this function here, maybe something else is calling clean track. You know, maybe like when I request to the API, that's calling clean track. And you just made a change over here, and all of a sudden it's messing something up over here. And you, so, and all you did was check this function, not this one, right? So it's like your as your code becomes complicated, what are you gonna do? Try every single function and remember what every function did. And remember, you didn't necessarily write all these functions, so you're going to tap every developer on the on the shoulder and ask them what they how everything worked. A code base is a million. Literally, the code base I work with is a million lines long. For you, nobody has the entire code base in their head. So this is this is the only documentation really of what all the requirements are. And what's nice is I don't have to reread all of that documentation to make a change in the code. I just run it. And if it breaks, and that happens all the time, that you'll make a change, say, I don't know why they're doing it this way, run run the test, and then all of a sudden three tests break, but that's okay. You can maybe you're like you figure out, oh, okay, I can I can get these tests to work. I just, you know, I just have to and I can still update this code, just you know, do it a little slightly differently, something like that. Right? Um, so that that's the type of thing. You know, that's 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 why. Is that this does this Going through, clicking through all your code takes time, like especially as your code becomes more complicated. So having something that automatically does this for you every single time is very useful. It takes so your code, your tests become so long that it takes too long to run all the tests on one computer. So literally what you'll do, there are companies that when you push to GitHub, it you know, and GitHub does this too, it runs all your tests on its machine in a faster way that way you and it literally takes 15 minutes to run all the tests or 20 minutes right because there's so much so many different scenarios that are being checked right and basically what happened if you know i worked with code bases that weren't tested before if you have a code base that what that it, it, you know didn't work before then some bug will occur you know you'll just you know the you'll break essentially someone will run into an error message um, and you won't, you won't even, one, you won't even know the change you made that caused the problem. Uh, two, you know, like it, it is basically all you're doing is tracking down bugs because the bugs are so hidden and they're so delayed. Here, I make the change in the code before I, uh, you know, before I like make it official, push it to production, I'm already, you know, checking that everything is green. Lots of times what will happen is, uh, Say someone pushes to production, they introduce a new bug, and now everybody's code has that same bug in it, and they think they were the cause of it. They didn't realize that, oh, actually it was this other developer who caused the bug. And now everybody's spending time tracking down the same bug. It's miserable, right? So like even in student group projects, I would like want there to be tests. Even in my own personal projects, I write tests because otherwise I'm just spending all my time tracking down bugs and finding them and not realizing I introduced a bug until, you know, a few days later or whatever, right? That happens a lot. So getting this immediate feedback, being able to run everything, every scenario before I like move something to production is, is really useful. Cool. So there should be like one test for one one particular problem? I'm telling you, the last times you'll have three tests, like three separate tests for one function. Like for you know, if you if this is the requirement, it, and you don't necessarily have to write it out all at once, but lots of times you will, you know. So lots of times what will happen is, you know, say your project manager or a product manager gives you the specifications. Hey, we want you know a clean track that does this X, Y, and Z. You'll then take those requirements and translate it into a test, you know, and say okay, when this occurs, this should occur. Uh, that's getting like a little, you know, we, we won't do that exact quite yet, but, you know, and eventually as you write out build projects, like that will be useful. The other thing is, like I said, like as you have questions about it, wait, what happens if we have 
remix, you know, it is in this title. Like, turn it into a test. Let me show you how, yeah, how we can do that. Def test that remix stays if it's in the title. Right? And then what do we do? Just take take the example, give yourself an example, and now we put remix in the title. Then what do you want to do? Call the function. Right? Set up. Call the function. What do I want to assert? Assert that this result includes this word remix. How do I do that? Just done. Write the test. PyTest. Uh, oh, sorry, PyTest index.py. Now we have two little dots here because I have two passing tests. How long did that take me to write? I mean, obviously I'm practiced at it. I've been, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, as you get better at writing tests, this process takes no time at all. But it saves you a lot of issues, right? What are you doing here? You're checking for a bug before the bug occurs. You're making sure, hey, here's something that could cause a bug, right? If they have the word remix in the title, let's write a test for it and we're done. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you ship out the code with these tests? Let, let me show you, good question. Uh, let me just plug in my computer. And uh, you do, but you put them in a separate file. And, and let me also look in the chat. I saw a question there too. Do you rewrite a test after refactoring the code? Good question, Lay. Uh, so we have two questions. One is like, do we ship out the code with the tests? And then the other one is, do you rewrite the test after refactoring the code? No, what normally happens for the second question about do you rewrite the tests after refactoring? So first of all, refactoring, this means like rewriting the code uh, in either like faster or generally for me, it's more clear implementation, okay? So refactoring doesn't change behavior, right? It doesn't make the, give you a new feature, it doesn't, it's for a developer. It just makes the code cleaner to read, okay? So if I'm changing this, let's say I, let's say me refactoring is deleting this, okay? Well, what do you wanna do? You wanna check that, all right, it, it was, were those spaces actually necessary? If they were not, I should be able to just rerun, run all my same tests again, and they should all pass, right? Because I changed the code, but nothing should be broken. And so let's do it. I think something will, they both are broken, turns out. Why? Because I'm introducing an extra space. You can see that Sergeant Cup Pepper's Band. So now what, okay, we introduced another space here. Let's put it here. It seems like I didn't need this space, but maybe I do need this one. Let's rerun it. Uh, so I would have thought that worked and it did not work. Um, so, and I just wanna make sure. So let's see, we're breaking here. We're breaking index.py line 23. And this looks right to me, right? But I think what's happening is my code is having a space at the very end, right? So it's a, you know, it's a good thing I had the test because, right, I've realized, oh, actually each one of these spaces is necessary, right? I could have, ch I could change the implementation if I want to, but this seems probably the best implementation. So rerun the test. Now we're back to green, right? So I'm free to now change my code, try different things. Is this necessary? And then run the tests and make sure, okay, everything stays the same. Yeah, are there general classifications of tests as in categories of tests that one typically, this is an awesome question, Christina, uh, that one typically needs to run? Okay, are, are there, sorry, are there different categories of tests? There are. So these are tests, right now what we're doing are tests for a specific function, okay? For, to make sure this clean track function works the way it should. Those are called unit tests, all right? Where you have a, uh, have uh, each test, each unit test just tests a specific function. 
What you may also test is, let's say you test like, uh, it's easier with like a website, but you could test, um, all right, we make the request and then clean the data and then load it to the database. So when I call make the request, clean the data, right? And maybe we'll just say that, like these two things occur. That would be an integration test, right? Integration test is connecting the dots. It, it involves multiple functions generally, or it could involve one function that calls, you know, that calls multiple functions. When we get to building APIs, we'll, we'll start, we'll actually use some integration tests. So that would be an example of like, like you can imagine when we go to the Google Books API, uh, here's an example. Think about everything that has to happen, right, for this to occur, right? We make the, someone makes a request, it has to return this JSON. But in order for that to occur, right, it has to like go to the database, it has to, you know, do the search properly. So this relies on kind of other things happening under the hood. And you, you would probably write an integration test to be like, all right, this is bigger than just one function. I want to check that when someone goes here, I get this output as JSON. And that involves multiple steps underneath. So that's called an integration test. And you would do separate, you would do both, by the way. You would both test each individual function and you would test that basically they stitch together in a way that we get the, you know, the overall result you want. So that's something we, we will see integration tests, but not for like two months or something or like six weeks. Cool. Other questions? Uh, did you already answer the other question? No, I didn't. So okay, okay. let's move to that now. So generally the way that you'll do this is we will make a separate file. In fact, yeah, let's make a separate file for now and we'll call it and generally it's the same name as the original. You just put the word test in front of it. So I'll do test index.py. And now what I'll do is I'm gonna copy these functions over here. And generally, yeah, this is notes. Let's move this to notes. All right, so you can see that actually like my code base stays small. In fact, I don't even need this either. We don't need any of this. This is fine. And now we'll, yes, yeah, so we actually don't need any of that. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We're going to run PyTest, and this is gonna break, by the way, we can already kind of see that. But we're gonna run PyTest calling this file, all right? So we're gonna do PyTest, and I'm gonna do test and run the file testindex.py. Notice what happens. It is still looking for every function that begins with the word test and then running it, okay? But we're getting this error of clean track is not defined, okay? So what should we do? Well, where are we kind of kicking off Python from? This testing folder. So we wanna take this perspective of this and import, right? Import the necessary clean track function. So from here, it would be from index, right? From index, import clean track. All right. So now, what's going to happen is I'll run my I'll run pytest. That will first thing it will do is import the clean track function. Then it will run each every time it sees the word test, it runs that function. And this test says to run clean track, passing through this data and then run the test. And they both, they both pass. I'll break this down more because I know this is probably confusing. Let's put breakpoints everywhere to understand this better. So put a breakpoint here and then we'll put a breakpoint actually right here. So I'm just going to run PyTest again. All right, here we go. 
So we're in this index.py, sorry, I'm in test index.py, line six, test that clean track returns a string. So we're right here. Now, you know, you will, let's say we want to dig around. Let's look at track name. Track name comes from here, right? This local variable. What's going to happen next? We're going to call this function clean track passing through track name. That should take us, right? So we're passing through this data with the hyphen remix. It's going to take us to clean track. So we should wind up right here. And then it's going to split this, do square bracket zero. All right, so I'm gonna type continue. It's gonna, we're right here, right? So now it's gonna call clean track. So now look where we are. Now we are in the index.py file, index.py line four in clean track, right here. If you look at what track name is, what is track name? Track name is this thing. Why? Because we are passing it through right here. Right, you're calling this function, passing through this data, and you know that's what's executing the function and getting us right here. So if you look at track name, it's this, and then what happens next? What happens next is this code right here. Track name dot split, right? Square bracket zero. Okay, when this is done, this clean track is done. That means this function is done. We'll go, sorry, this function is done. We'll go back to our code. I can, we can put another breakpoint if we want. And we'll get right, we'll be done, and then we'll go back to the test. So this is really like understanding exactly what Python does, right? You call PyTest, PyTest calls this function. It declares this variable. It calls, you tell it to call the clean track function, passing through this as an argument. So it goes to this, executes the function, takes the data, splits it, returns it, throws it over the wall. Then we're done with this function. We go back here. Take the data from here. This is a string. Call type on it. Check that it's a string. Go to the next function. Right? Let's do it one more time. So I'm, I'm going to call pytest, testindex.py. It's going to run this function first. So the first thing that happens is we're in line six. We're, bit, we're right here. You see track name. Then I'm going to type continue to get past this breakpoint. It's going to call this function with remix, with this string, right? And we'll wind up right here. So I'll do continue. It calls the clean track function right here, pass through this. Then it pauses because we're in our breakpoint. If you want, you can play around the code. What is track name? Track name is that original dirty, this thing. Split it, take the first element, whatever. Um, if I took put hood continue, we are then, this function will successfully execute and we'll continue on our way and we'll hit the next breakpoint. So now where are we? We are should be right here. So let's look at what clean track is. Clean track is my clean data, right? Because we passed it through my function. It split it, took the first element, returned it, set it equal to this variable. Now we're here. And then now we do, we can type, you know, if we want, we do type clean track is a string. Does that string equal this? It does. We should be good. Type continue. That will uh, shoot. Oh, why is this hitting this? Because now it's running the next test, right? Calling the clean track function, and we are right here again. All right, so we hit our breakpoint again, and now we'll be done. And we can see both of them passed. Okay, questions about this? Uh, so that means the assert statement needs to be it will not be a part of the uh, code right actual code correct is that right that's correct and, it's part of the test yeah. and this code will typically will be executed by the qa team or the test team not uh, no, when, when no, they do the by a developer by a developer qa team actually generally writes their own tests okay, uh they'll okay. they'll be like what if i type in a thousand 
like character event to here will it break like they'll, they'll write some weird tests like alternative universe type tests that like i just generally wouldn't think of but the developer generally writes like normal like all right what about this what about that qa team they'll just like start pounding on the you know type right typing in weird characters on the keyboard because users do you know unexpected things and and they'll check for that but yeah, developer will write this, developer will run this. Like when you make a change, run the tests. It takes a second. Run the tests. You know. And I just need to remove my breakpoint here. But yeah, run, run. There it is. Did it, how, how hard? It's not hard. Just run the tests. Like my, this is why you like going back to my friend who's like, just read the error message. Yeah, just to read there. Like if you run tests, you can just read the error message. The error message tells you whether or not your change worked or not. You know, like another developer I worked with too, he would just be like, stop thinking, just run the test. Like, like, like I would like write some code and be like, well, is this going to work? Wait, it's splitting here, square brackets. You stop, just run the test. You know, let it tell you. Don't waste your mental energy. Um, okay, so then let's clean the other questions before I show this a little bit differently. I'm just going to reorganize this. So let's make a directory called source, and we'll make another directory called tests. And this is normally how you'll do this. And then we'll move index.py into source. So I'm moving this file into the source folder. All right, and then I'm also going to move... Uh, test index into the tests file. All right. And now I'm going to, where will I run PyTest from? I run PyTest from here. In fact, I don't even, you know, so far what I've done is I've specified PyTest test index, or sorry, test. I've done something like this. But if the name of the file begins with the word test, and if you have a folder with the name test, it will go to the test folder and run every file that begins with the word test in that folder. And then in that file, it will run every function that begins with the word test. So I can just run PyTest. I mean, I'll start doing it the other way, I guess. Yeah, I'll just run PyTest. And it broke. But it did run it. You can see it. It ran test index.py line one, and it broke. Right, so when we just typed in the word PyTest, Right? It said, oh, is there a test folder inside here? Yes, there is. Inside the test folder, is there any files that begin with the word test? Yes, there is. So now I'm going to run PyTest. And here it says no module named index. Why does it say that? Because where are we running PyTest from? Right here. Where is the word? We don't see the word index anywhere, do we? No. There's no word index. So what is there? There's source, and then inside source, there's index. So we'll do from source.index, import the clean track function, right? Because I'm running it from here, testing, and I'm gonna say from source.index, import this function, and then we'll work. I'm just kidding. No module name source. Oh, shoot. Do I have to do this? I have to do this annoying thing, I think. I'm sorry. I think I have to do dunder dunder init. No, not there. I have to do it in the... Sorry about this, guys. I think I have to do this in the test file, in the test folder. Dunder dunder init.py. Let's see if that works. Yeah, that worked. Why do you have to do that? I don't know. I don't know, guys. Python, it, it makes you write, you, you have to create this file in the test folder called dunder dunder init dunder dunder dot pi. So you literally would, it would be touch dunder dot two, two underscores. That's what I mean by dunder dunder dot uh, init two underscores dot pi. It like makes this a package. And for that reason, it's it's pretty. And for that reason, you're able to see 
Uh, I think it's like this is able to import from a sibling directory. Like I said, it's pretty complicated reasoning. I just know when this thing breaks, put this in here. And that's basically what I know. All right. So notice, so just to show you, this now works. All I'm doing inside here, I'm putting nothing inside this file. This is a normal Python file. It's just called this weird name. And then in test index, I can now say, okay, from source, right? I'm call, calling Python PyTest from here. So go to source.index and import this function. All right, and that works. Then for my console, I kind of, what did we say? We said we kind of keep it in this outside folder. So let's do that. Touch console.py. Now we have a console, and we'll say from same logic from source.index import whatever it was called uh, clean track. All right. If you want to give yourself some data, you can like, track equals uh, this, right? So now you have two different ways to interact with your code. One is to write, run the test, right? Just run the test, pi test, and it passes or put in a breakpoint and be like, you know, put a breakpoint to check some stuff. The other way you can run your code is to do python3 dash i console.py. This also has my function, right? And now I have track name, you know, and you can start to play with this. Track name dot split, or you can call the clean track function. And that works. So in both cases, I'm importing, you know, using the same, and why is this so useful? Because remember, if say this clean track function needs to, uh, let's say it references something else, Let's say it references another file called new, like uh, album.py. And it, we need to import from album, import, you know, clean album. What will this be? It's always going to be source. And regardless if I run the tests, right, because I'm running my tests, regardless if I'm running the tests, like doing pi tests, I'm doing it from this folder. If I'm running console.py, I'm doing it from the same folder. So in both cases, I always need to go start with the word source. So I'm purposely structuring this, my code, so that regardless of if I'm running my tests, regardless of if I just want, like, want to use this console as like your sandbox, in both cases, I'm always just starting with the word source from source.album, import this function. If I do console, you know, then the perspective from console is to start with the source. If I do tests, I'm, again, I'm running it from this folder. So the perspective is start with the word source and import clean album or whatever. Okay, so this is the structure. So it's like, let's just see this. So you see, I have kind of like the code base. Generate, let's call this something else. Uh, move testing to like Rolling Stone. But, uh, yeah, that's fine. So it'd be like, here's my code base. Here's the tests. Here's the code. And then here's like some sort of console.py. If you look at uh, GitHub Airflow, you can start to see this. Here's the tests. Right, at kind of this overall project directory. Um, I wonder, I don't know if they have like a console, but here's a setup, here's like kind of an overall file maybe that would that would call, that maybe you would run this overall file. It's kind of like kicking off your code. Uh, and then inside, so here's our tests, and then you would have, maybe here is like your code. I'm not sure, they might have another directory, but you can see everything is on this kind of level. Here is probably the code, Airflow. So this, these tests, what should they be doing? Probably importing from Airflow or, let's see. Here we go, from Airflow. 
dot API dot client local client because we're starting at this we're going to run PyTest from this folder and here's tests and tests is going to say all right look for airflow then go to the next file then go to the next file so we go to tests it goes look for look for airflow then import this then import this all right same thing that we're doing we are saying go to source and import everything from there. So let's take a look. If we look at tests, go start as source, because we're running from this folder. And then if we run the console, same thing. We're running the console from that same Rolling Stones folder. So in terms of how we view it, we view it's always starting with source. Just like here, they're always starting with Airflow. Right now we're back at root. They're always starting with airflow and the test is on the same level. All right, I might have went too far, but I uh, hopefully this you can, I wanted to show you this overall structure that you'll build up to. Questions before I so what I'll do is I'll 